I'm hoping to present quite a radical, non-PC view of what's going on in the world that really impacts leaders. There are many dynamics at play, such as speed, shorter and less and less resources, less and less time, poor relationships that are really impacting leaders everywhere. And in contrast to that very dire, glum picture, I also present a model of the kind of leadership that works well in turbulence, chaotic times, which is there's only one kind of leader that people in the world want, and I will lead people through a process to discover they already know the kind of leadership that makes sense to humans and that actually encourages us to participate and contribute. So I'm both presenting how difficult it is for leaders these days and an alternative model that people will already be familiar with in their own experience. The whole morning into the afternoon of activity, so I'd like to explain how it's going to work. I'm going to present for about an hour, and I have a goal, which is to be as non-politically correct as possible. <laughs> and I hope you will just come along with me on that. And I am presenting things from a global perspective, and I think that's actually quite helpful when you realize that what you're suffering from or experiencing is being is common around the world. Now that can be both depressing and reassuring at the same time. And I think you'll have both of those emotions. I'm going to speak for an hour and then you're going into a conversation that is meant to illuminate in your own experience many of the concepts that I will be describing here about what is uh, good leadership period. What is good leadership? I don't care if it's turbulent or calm or whatever. What is good leadership? And I'm going to, through these questions, have you explore your own experience with a good leader. And I'm confident that you will all be um, in deep congruence about the characteristics of good leaders. And then we'll um, have time in the workshops, if you're participating in them, to really explore in more detail uh, what this means for your own leadership and how you implement things. So look at this photo. Can, can you dim some light so the screen shows up better up there without inhibiting the camera? Can you see what that is? OK, it's Hurricane Katrina coming in from the Gulf Coast. For me, it's an incredibly powerful image. So you're going to tell me if you can see it well enough. Is, it's clear? OK, because from here at the angle, it's not. So I'm going to talk about three things. And uh, one is the global dynamics over which we have no control, but that are seriously impacting our leadership. And uh, then the second question is one about personal vocation. I'm, Paul, I'm just so thrilled with everything you said. But to think about public service as a vocation and to be returning again and again to that clarity of why am I putting up with so much nonsense? And why am I putting up with these insults and this insanity on the part of decision makers? We have to return to a sense of vocation and calling. And then the third bit, which we will talk about more in the workshops, but I, I do want to go through what do, you, what do you have to be prepared for if you really want to be implementing this form of leadership? which I am describing as the difference between heroic leadership and hosting leadership. And I will explain those terms in a little while. But the first thing I'd like to talk about is my sense of what's going on in our globalized culture. It's operating as a centrifuge extractor. Now, you may not remember your science, but centrifugal force is the kind that spins things away from each other. And the sole purpose of a centrifuge extractor is to take ingredients or solutions that were combined and separate them, and separate them by using speed. 
So for me, this is a very apt metaphor of what's going on in this global culture. It's not specific to any area. It's happening everywhere. Because we are moving so fast and in such a complex setting that we're actually spinning away from each other, have less time for relationships, less time for thinking. And this is a, a kind of devolution of human capacity that I find very alarming. I especially find it alarming because this is a truth that I see throughout history. Human, we can get through anything as long as we're together. But we can't get through turbulence, we can't get through chaotic times, we can't get through uncertainty just by isolating ourselves and ticking off the boxes on our task list. So for me, this is the, the biggest framing I can put of, of our great dilemma at this time, is how do we restore relationships to our organizations how do we lead from a position of establishing good, clear, trusting relationships as Paul described? Because that's the only way we're going to get through this time. So let me talk a little bit about these global dynamics. And as I said, it, what part of this is meant to show you how depressing it really is. Part of it is meant to show you that there is an ever more urgent need for the kind of leadership that Paul just described. That it's up to us to determine whether we're up for this, whether we're willing to step forward. And these global dynamics are beyond our control. So they're just things we have to account for and notice without thinking that we're going to change most of them, although we can change some of them. So the first is, the endless resource squeeze. You're not the only place in the world that is being told, well, you just have to do more with less, right? Well, it doesn't work that way, as you'll see in a moment. One of the things that we're squeezed is not just money, but it's relationships and time. Those things are disappearing. So we're working in a culture now, I mean, I was just overhearing someone on the patio describe how uh, they're expected to work for 24 hours straight or such. So two years ago, there were three years ago now, an article in Harvard Business Review called The Acceleration Trap, and it said this, that employees now are expected to work two to four times harder than before. And they gave new language to this because it was such an obvious uh, trend, so you, you can get your choice of words that best describe your own experience. Do you feel overloaded? Do you feel multi-loaded? Do you feel perpetually loaded? What's behind this is a belief that you and I are just like machines. There's no other explanation for it. And we're told that we can work harder, we can work faster, and we can work smarter, and that there are no limits to that pushing of us. But I'm sure you've all discovered uh, there are limits, right? One of the things that's adding to the complexity of work these days is a constant use of policies, rules, and regulations to get us to do work that it is assumed we would not do on our own. So one of the great shifts that has gone on right now, and I'm glad that Paul mentioned trust, because when you look at the environment of governments everywhere who are just insisting on putting more rules and regulations in place, at the heart of that is distrust, is a belief that you and I will not do the work and will not do it well unless there are specific guidelines, standards, measurement, et cetera, et cetera. So um, my cousins live in London and I, there's a nice little NHS health clinic across the street from their home and one day, I was, a few months ago, I was walking down the street there, 
and there was a little handwritten sign in the window that said, uh, this clinic will now be closed on Thursday afternoons so we can catch up with our paperwork, all right? And then underneath it they had written, this will in no way diminish our service to you. And I thought, really? <laughs> you really expect me to believe this? But think about in your own work now, the number of reports that you are writing and the amount of time, when are you doing those? When are you fulfilling all the reporting responsibilities that keep getting piled on people? And again, this is not just here. This is happening everywhere. It's a whole system that is driven by a profound distrust of people at this point. We have to be guarded, we have to be watched, we have to be supervised, we have to file these reports. And I hear from many, many leaders that they're so busy writing reports about their work that they don't have time to do the work for which they're writing their report, right? So there is some head nodding. This is an increasing problem everywhere that I go. So it's led to what I would characterize as these morbidly obese bureaucracies that simply can't function anymore. It's a beast that we're feeding with our reports. You may be in the position where you're requiring reports from other people. And just observe what it is doing to your sense of capacity, of your sense of making a difference, of your sense of actually doing meaningful work. I told you this was going to be depressing, right? So <laughs> you just have to bear with me because this is reality. So another thing that's really impacting leaders is this culture of blame. You can see it in governments everywhere. They come in on big promises of how they're going to change everything for the better. And then what happens? They don't change things for the better. They make a big mess of it. We blame them and we vote them out. We vote in the next group. And, and there's this kind of vacillation going on in governments now that's quite something. I'm from the US. We no longer have a government. I mean, all they do is fight. They don't do anything helpful whatsoever. And that's not an exaggeration, by the way. But you're a leader, so I'm sure you've had this experience of being blamed for something. Is that true? If you haven't, then you have to get down on your knees every night and thank God. <laughs> Somehow you've avoided this dynamic. But in this culture of blame, what happens is we believe that singular individuals are responsible for very complex issues and that the way to deal with a complex issue is just change the person who's at the leadership helm or just change the team around or move the boxes on the org chart. This kind of simplistic thinking when we are dealing with complexity beyond our imagination, beyond our experience right now. This kind of thinking that it's a world of simple cause and effect leads to what is another big problem, which is every time we go and try and solve a problem, we create 10 more. Because we haven't looked at multiple causes. And if you've had that target placed on you of blame, you know that you weren't responsible all by yourself, right? Unless you have a kind of godlike complex and then you say, well, yeah, I did. I'm responsible. It's not true, right? You know, if anything went wrong, that there were many players, there were many causes to that. And so in this culture of blame, what's disappearing is our thoughtfulness at understanding complex problems. So we're not solving them. We're just shifting the blame around from leader to leader, politician to politician. Does this make sense to you in your experience? Yeah. So a lot of people are feeling this way, just totally overwhelmed and exhausted. And you have to look at your own levels of fatigue, your own levels of what's your health like, 
What's your level of exhaustion? Has that changed? Are you one of these people? How often? I, I uh, notice how people respond to questions like, well, how are you? It used to be that people would say, well, I'm busy. I'm really busy. Recently in London, I heard someone say, oh, I'm busy, busy, busy. <laughs> or I'm wicked busy. Or I'm, you know, stretched to the max busy. We, we can't find sufficient adjectives now to describe this pace. So one of the things that happens when people are overwhelmed and exhausted and the human brain basically is under a lot of stress, one of the things that happens is we lose all of the capacities that we need, all the capacities that are what make us fully human. We lose the capacity, and this is just neuroscience, we lose the capacity to remember things. And how's your memory loss going? It's not age-related any longer. It's societal. We lose memory. We lose the ability to think for a period of time to go deeply into something. We develop these very superficial brain capacities. We're very good at flitting around, right? And the one thing that people with the brain under stress that we're good at is making lists. Does this ring home? I was told, and I'm, I'm sure this is still true, that half of the apps that are being developed are about planning and making lists because that's all we can do right now. And I don't know how you manage your lists. I still do this even though I make fun of it. I still find it satisfying even though I know it's a crock, which is at the end of the day, if I have done something that wasn't on my list, I will write it on the list so I could <laughs> check it off. I still find it deeply satisfying. <laughs> and I know it's foolish, but but what we lose, we lose the ability to think. We lose the ability to reason. We lose the ability to deal with complexity. We lose moral reasoning here. And we're just flitting from thing to thing to thing with this superficial sense of accomplishment. Well, I got through that list. And one of the ways you can see this in the workplace is if you get really excited about a new project and you take it to a, your group of your colleagues, and everyone is sitting there. This is especially if you're the boss here and you're getting really excited, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. If you have a group of exhausted, stressed staff, they are only hearing your excitement as, oh my God, that's 10 more things I have to do. Because there isn't time to really get down into the meaningfulness of it. So, as I will explain later, creating time to think is the antidote for all of this. But right now, I just want us to notice how much human capacity we have lost because of the way we are leading our lives in this very sped up, overwhelmed, and exhausted uh, place that most of us are in. So you can't multi-load, you can't perpetually load people, you can't ask people to work four times faster and expect that you're getting a full human capacity from that person. You're just gonna get someone whose life and the meaning of their work becomes more and more superficial and therefore meaningless. This is the great tragedy right now. And I use the word, I threw it in quickly, I'm gonna emphasize it now. When I look at what's happening to how we do our work and the lack of thinking, moral reasoning, uh, strong relationships, and again, and I see this globally, I actually believe that we are devolving as a species right now. We're not evolving to some higher form of consciousness. We are devolving because we're just becoming quite robotic in how we accomplish work. And that is not our fault. 
this is the fault of leadership models that insist that you and I can work five times faster than we are now, and we just need to pressure people to make sure they do that. So I think I may have just depressed you sufficiently, but I have one more piece here, and that's what's happening with distraction. So here are just a few photos. We think this was a date. <laughs> and then recently in LaGuardia Terminal in New York City and in Minneapolis Airport, some company has come in and put iPads at every chair. And this is a restaurant, as you can see. Uh, look at the number of screens that are in this image. So you can order your food on the iPad, um, or if you're sitting in a chair, you never have to talk to another human being while you're in these terminals now. It's just pure self-focused entertainment. And then in New Orleans, I was recently in this place called Community Coffee. And uh, my two and a half year old granddaughter, Liliana, uh, a few months ago said, today I wanna work like daddy. And this is what she set up for herself. <laughs> now this is, this is an issue for us because distraction means not paying attention. And the most compelling story that I uncovered about the role of distraction was why the Titanic sank. Because I always thought it was about arrogance, being the fastest, the biggest, you know, the most macho ship ever built. And in fact, it sank because of the distraction of the radio operator and the captain. So days before they entered the ice, they were receiving a lot of warnings from ships that there's a lot of ice here. And the captain just sort of cursorily looked at these radio messages coming in and, and made a slight course correction, but didn't slow down because they had this record to beat to get to New York. 40 minutes before they struck the iceberg, this always gives me chills to tell, they received a message from another ship saying, we're surrounded by ice. And the radio operator replied to them, shut up, shut up, I'm busy. Now that's a common mantra for a lot of us, right? Because we are overwhelmed, because we are working with a superficial brain. So the focus this week on mindfulness, on learning to be present, on paying attention, this is essential to our survival now. We can no longer believe that we're going to get anywhere good if we're in this mode of shut up, shut up, I'm busy. And how often do we say that to our children, to our partners? How often are you bothered when a colleague comes to your door, if you still have a door? Um, and what I find is people approach each other in the workplace now by saying, I'm sorry to bother you. Do you, have a, do you have 30 seconds? Do you have a minute? I just need to get a quick answer. And we don't even go to each other now. We do it all via text or email because it takes too much time. Shut up, I'm busy. I got work to do here. I got tasks to tick off. Okay. Maybe I've depressed you sufficiently that we can move on. But again, you know, the reason I do this is not from some macabre <coughs> sense of delight in depressing people. It's because I feel that we have to look reality in the face so that we can choose to be leaders for this time, not some imaginary time, not some oh, everything's going to be all right time. That when we really look at what's going on in the workplace and in society, then we can consciously make a choice 
to be a different kind of leader. So that's, that's the method to uh, this descent into very depressing thing. It is a very depressing time. Let's face it, let's not put energy into denying it. There are places like Monmouthshire that are exemplary and they're struggling to maintain that in this raging sea of disregard, insane decisions on the part of politicians. You know, austerity is not just in the UK, it's happening everywhere now. So that's why I start with this what I believe is a truthful glimpse into the workplace because we need to face it so that we can commit to the vocation, the feeling that we're in this because we want to be leaders for this time. But there are other ways to respond to this. So this is a pretty common approach. I believe this was from the 1930s in Britain, this poster originally. And then my son, who, one of my sons who's now a man, uh, sent me this. <laughs> so what I'd first like to do here is give you some questions as a way of developing a lens into what's going on in your staff groups. And you won't have time to talk about this right now, but what I'd like you to do is just go through these questions with me. And then uh, I'll give you a chance to think about which one is most important for you to carry home and to begin a, as a conversation starter with your colleagues or your staff. So if you were to look now at your staff or team, and as you're looking at now, also be thinking about how it was a few years ago, because we're looking for trends here. So what is the quality of relationships now? What's going on with trust, with criticism, with judgments? And how would you compare that to a few years ago? What is the level of fatigue and exhaustion in your colleagues and maybe in yourself as well? And what's the quality of thinking? I talked so much about the superficial brain, right? So. Are people able to see the big picture? Are people able to look into the future? Does the future come into your conversation? And are people learning from experience? How would you assess generally whether you're still working with a group of colleagues or staff who can think. <laughs> you know, these are some indicators that people are in a different quality of thoughtfulness when they think about consequences into the future, when they think about the systemic consequences, the big picture, when they can connect the dots. These are signs that people still have their brains turned on. And this is probably the most critical question, that when something goes wrong, how do people respond? Do they blame? Do they cover up? Or do you gather together to really think it through? Why did this happen? And in terms of a trend analysis, if you were to continue in this way for another year, where will you be? Now, some of you have been very diligent in writing them all down, 
But what I'd like you all to do is just take a moment and which question popped out at you is, yes, that's the one we need to talk about first. Go for the, the, the first thought one. Which of these seems a wonderful entry into a good conversation with colleagues or staff? And just choose one. And then I'd like to ask you to make a commitment to silently <laughs> to actually start this conversation when you go back next week. This will open up very good, thoughtful conversation around important things. So now if you were a younger group, none of you would have been taking notes. You just would have come up with your smartphones and taken a photo. <laughs> so it was just a little test, you know. <laughs> OK, so now I'd like to move on to this question of uh, how do we use our leadership? I mean, you're here. You're obviously committed to learning. You're seemingly obviously committed to developing your leadership skills. But the deeper commitment, as I said earlier and as Paul introduced, <laughs> is a vocational call. Even though it's getting increasingly hard for good leaders, and this is my observation worldwide, that good programs are being cut even though there's evidence that they yield great benefit for the issues they're addressing they get swept away in budgetary decisions. Staff are being cut for no good reason, no rhyme or reason, except it looks easier on paper. You have smaller costs. Leaders, good leaders, are finding it increasingly difficult to lead in ways that they used to be able to. So they're struggling now to maintain their integrity, their courage, their values in the midst of a very uh, difficult set of circumstances. So for me, leadership has changed from what many of you might have signed up for. And leadership has changed radically just in the past five or six years. Radical shifts in the preeminence of austerity cuts of, uh, you know, we talk in many countries, they use the phrase evidence-based decision making. That's just a crock of shit. <laughs> really, there's no other way to describe it. One, one school administrator in Canada called it, uh, well, this is actually decision-based evidence making you know, using whatever they want against you and your program. Because everyone has now a very political, personal agenda. But we don't have to be that kind of leader. We have to recognize, though, that we are making a choice. And it has to be conscious. I think, you know, one of my great leaders, who's also a personal friend, uh, was sitting in the midst of a terrible meeting with the federal government over hurricane relief several years ago. Nothing was happening bureaucratically. It was just a ridiculous situation. People were still suffering. They didn't have roofs on their home. They had to go through this complex series of writing out, filling out applications. I mean, some of the social service agencies were there just to teach people how to fill out the applications, not to give them services, but how to work the bureaucracy. So she sent me a text, because she was in despair at this meeting. She said, every day I make a decision not to give up. And for me, that's an important realization, that we are going to be continually tested now. If we're trying to be a forward-thinking, compassionate leader that makes a difference in the, in the lives of the people you serve, 
you're going to have to consciously choose this in the midst of setbacks and failures and criticism and insanity. I find the insanity is the hardest thing to take right now. I, why would you decide that? And remember, I'm from the United States, so I have a lot of case material here. <laughs> okay. But so do you now. So that's, do we choose to be a leader who, in, in my newest book, I'm describing this as, can we be warriors for the human spirit? Can we be warriors in the sense of the word that it's used in Tibetan, which is a warrior is one who is brave, but brave enough not to use fear and aggression, but actually brave enough to work with human capacity and trust in it. So this is our choice right now. We can go along, get along, we can just become better at report writing, measurement taking, and just let the inanity and the meaninglessness of it gradually corrode our spirits, because that's what's happening. Or we can choose to step forward in this very, much more noble role. I think leadership is a much more noble calling right now as we try and stand up against the encroaching um, dehumanization that's going on. So we stand on good shoulders. People throughout history have persevered. This is from the Battle of Midway. It's a Washington, D.C. monument. They had no right to win, yet they did, and in doing so, they changed the course of a war. Even against the greatest of odds, there is something in the human spirit, a magic blend of skill, faith, and valor that can lift men from certain defeat to incredible victory. When do we even think of staff groups as possessing skill, faith, and valor? These are very old-fashioned words, but they speak to what is true about human nature. And as leaders, if we truly want to be these leaders who are warriors for the human spirit, then the first thing we have to determine is how much do we believe in other people's goodness and capacity. So the Dalai Lama said that we must begin by putting faith in the basic goodness of human nature. And we need to anchor this faith in some fundamental and universal principles. So for me, what a leader believes about people is the crucial determinant of where their leadership will go. So, and I ask this of you as well. Do we see people as the problem, something to be managed, something to be put up with, something to supervise, or do we see people as the blessing? Do we believe that people are innately creative, intelligent, generous, altruistic? Or do we believe, as the society tells us, that we are selfish, competitive, out for ourselves? Now, there's a lot of evidence right now that people are selfish and out for themselves and thrive on competition and just acting in a very self-protective way. There's an enormous amount of evidence, and some of them are living in your homes right now. <laughs> because our teens are so incredibly narcissistic, most of them. And maybe so are we. But beneath that, what is your experience with human nature? What is your experience? So, when have you been surprised to realize that people are innately generous? Or when have you been surprised at someone's creativity, someone's stepping forward? When have people that you've written off surprised you by showing some qualities that we could call goodness or creativity or talent? And as I said, for leaders, this is the fundamental question because everything hinges 
on what I as a leader believe about you and your capacity. So, same granddaughter, by the way. Um, so now we're going to explore what is the answer to this question. But the word that's most important up there is innate. This is not something we are training and developing people to. This is some, these are capacities we are discovering in people. Now, let's talk for a moment about the dominant model, the growing model. It's growing more dominant of the leader is hero. This is a 16th century sculpture from the Flemish area, and it has some very interesting qualities to it. Like you see this. These are human legs. This is the knee, torso, foot's down there. So there's a political commentary here that the heroic leader who thinks it's all up to him uh, is actually doing it on the backs of everyday people, soldiers, slaves, whatever. Somebody looked at this and said, well, you know, the good thing about this form of leadership is that he's unarmed. So, <laughs> so the same sculptor uh, did this statue, of, which I'm calling the leader is host. And what I mean by that, the, the fundamental difference between these two forms of leadership, which you will discover in your conversation groups in a little while, is that the leader as host knows that it's up to other people to be creative, that other people are as caring and committed to the organizational goals as the leader is. Whereas the, the leader as hero believes it's all up to me. I'm the one who makes it happen. Now this can have two sides to it. There can be the forceful, big ego, macho-like leader as hero, but there can also be the selfless leader, which I see in a lot of women, where I see that we know the problems are increasing and we just say, well, somebody's got to take care of this and we just keep stepping in and stepping in and stepping in. That kind of leadership, that heroic leadership, is as destructive as the take charge kind of leader. It's destructive of our health. It's destructive of our relationships. We become overwhelmed. We become bitchy. We start to feel, and why isn't anyone out there helping me? So e any form of taking things on yourself, either for selfless service or for, I know I'm the smartest and most creative person here, either of those forms lead to, to disaffectiveness. We just can't get good things done. Now the leader is host, which we'll talk about little bit later, simply relies on other people's innate goodness, their creativity, their caring, their talents, and sees, the leader's host is more like a good teacher who sees potential in others and creates the conditions for that potential to take form. But you're going to talk about this in your groups. So this is how we organize. Right? This is very familiar. I hear it was talked about yesterday. Um, this is how life organizes. So in creating networks, all that we're doing is we're starting to organize in the way that human beings naturally organize, the way that all of life organizes, networks of interdependent relationships. But even though that's life's form of organizing, and even though if you were to chart your relationships, who you call, who you go to, who you have fun with, who you speak, seek coaching or counseling or mentoring from, it would never look like this, would it? Right? 
This isn't how we live our lives. We don't create org charts, and then when something goes wrong in a relationship, we rearrange the person and put them in a different box. We don't do that. And it doesn't work in organizations either. So this is how all of life organizes. But I want to spend a few moments in answering this question. The assumptions about people that are built into this are really very horrible. And I think it's best connoted by this photo. The belief is that you can create hierarchy because some people are better than others. Some people are smarter. Some people have the right training. Other people should just comply with them. Some people are entrepreneurs, but they're scarce. These are all assumptions that are false, so please don't take notes. Some people are very creative, and we reward them because the rest of us are dummies. Some people need independence because they're so entrepreneurial. Some people have vision. That's why they become leaders. And the rest of us are just dregs. We have to be carefully managed. And the basic assumption, by the way, that's underneath all this horrible stuff about us is that we are controllable, that people do what they're told, that people, you just give them the right standards, the right reports to write, the right measures, and everything works fine. So it's the most disabling and dehumanizing set of, of assumptions that I can find anywhere. And it's becoming stronger as we go down this morbidly obese bureaucratic road. So one of the ways we approach organizational change is you can easily see this embodied. So we have problems and we have a vision for the future, right? Now what's inherent in this analysis? You've probably learned gap analysis, have you? Is this a familiar term to you? I mean, it's pretty well taught. But here are the questions behind it. What's wrong with them? It's always them. Um, how can we fix them? How can we motivate them? And how, of course, can we increase productivity? And there seems to be a set of problems that leaders have to solve. So people are lacking in internal motivation. They are problems to be solved. And they are filled with lacks, with deficits, with problems that have to be corrected in order for the organization to get to this robust, radiant future. What this leads to, this is a vicious cycle I'm describing is it leads to the conclusion that people need strong leaders who are going to tell them what to do with outside experts coming in and, and imposing solutions. Does this feel familiar? Yeah. This is what's going on right now. Even as you're sitting here being filled with learning and possibilities, somebody somewhere in the government is writing a new policy to constrain and control you because you're problematic. So this is a, a very nasty, brutish set of assumptions. But it's evident as I travel around different governments especially, this is what's going on. So then we step into uh, the leader as host. And I want to say right now that this is counter-cultural. This is truly revolutionary in all the context that I just described. This is acting as a leader because of what you know and believe about people's innate creativity and caring and commitment. But you become counter-cultural in these in this current environment. And I want to say that because it, what it also implies is this is really hard work. This is work that has to be based on a sense of vocation. 
not just going along to get along, not just in it for your own self-advancement. So I want to quickly go over some principles. These will come out in greater depth, um, both in your conversations to follow and also in the workshops. But here are some basic principles about leadership that I wish could be tattooed on the arms of every single leader. People only support things that they have played a part in creating. We've known this in 1940s in Wales <laughs> is where this was first clear. In a Welsh coal mine, I don't know where it was located, but the circumstances, it became so dangerous that the supervisors stopped going down into the mine. And somebody noted over time that the, mine be the miners became more productive without the supervisor present. And that's when this started. So this is mid-1940s, so how many years is that? It's almost 70 years that we've known this. But still, we deny it. We still think that if we want people's support, we have to do ownership campaigns and vast rollouts to sell programs to people and put you know, monetary rewards on their behavior. Everything that is external denies this fact. Now what this does not mean, I really want to emphasize this, it does not mean that everyone needs to participate in every single decision. We're not talking about broad brush participation. We're talking about everyone feeling engaged at some point in the process and most importantly of touching the final product. This was a principle, again, from England in uh, socio-technical redesign of factories, which happened in the 60s. So I'm old enough to know when these things were hot. And um, in the 60s, we were redesigning long factory lines where people were doing very boring work. And the principle was, when you redesign it, make sure that no matter what people do, they get to touch or experience the final product. So if you're in a school system, you want everyone to be a graduation. If you're in healthcare, you want everyone to see you know, successful outcomes among patients and to affiliate with doctors and nurses. Wherever you are, you want to make sure that you're in touch with citizens, with clients, with those who you have served in some way. So this is not about everyone sits in terrible meetings and tries to make decisions. We know that doesn't work. But there are many ways to keep people engaged, and social media is one of those ways. But also face-to-face -face meetings, thanking people. These are ways to keep us engaged. So a corollary to this, this is two more of my granddaughter, um, is that people act responsibly when they care about the work. Now everyone talks about, complains about the lack of accountability, the lack of values, especially in younger people. Um, it's not what's going on in my estimation. What's going on is that we are creating intrinsically meaningless work and then trying to force people to do it. So if you want to build health and participation and energy and creativity, you have to find work that is meaningful to people, that they care about. And by the way, you don't have to do 100% meaningful work. What we're finding is, and again, we've known this for many years now, decades we've known this, that if 10% of people's work is meaningful, and it's usually meaningful because you're touching the person for whom the agency or ministry or office exists, 10% of that then allows people to put up with 90% of just writing the reports and doing it. So, but again, you have to have a different quality of understanding what motivates us. This is about internal motivators. And the last P 
piece here is that diversity is a source of riches. It creates capacity. Now, most of us see it as a problem. And it's been presented as a problem to be solved. <laughs> but it's the diversity of views, perceptions, that allow us to see the complexity of an issue. So it's a critical way we gain insight and perspective and see the whole picture, not just our narrow focused one. So one of my principles, that re this is a magic charm up here right now. If you want to, if you're stuck in an organizational conversation where you're going round and round and round and you're not getting anywhere except people are getting more and more pissed off, um, you want to, the simplest way to change that round and round stuckness is to invite in new voices. This works really like magic. And it's the simplest way to bring diversity in. Not a big campaign, it's just you start to ask, well, who else should be here? Who else has insight in this? And then, since, this, since thinking has disappeared from most workplaces, learning from experience, sitting down, I'm going to go into this in a little more detail later, but sitting down and thinking, well, what did go wrong and why? What did work here and why? Encouraging people to slow down, get those brains working again, have the diversity in the group, and you'll be amazed at what you learn and what you see. Sometimes I feel really foolish in s making statements like I just did of, you know, we have to restore thinking. But I don't know what your experience is, how much time for thinking and problem solving and really going deeply. I don't know your workplaces. But if you're noticing that you're not thinking together with colleagues, then the best solution to that is when something big happens, you sit down and together you learn from it. It's not a post-mortem. That's a terrible phrase, by the way. It's about learning from experience. So I just want to give you a few little tips, I guess for how you get started if you're not already on this path of being a pioneering leader. So this image that I put up of the lone leader on a stormy beach was deliberate. This is lonely work. It's why it's so wonderful you can be together for a good number of days and really develop the relationships that will see you through. This is inherent. Being, as one of my colleagues said, it's lonely to get to the future first. And since we're trying to be a different kind of leader that stands against all of these terrible centrifugal dynamics of this time, you will find you need colleagues. You need support groups. So what you're forming here this week will be fundamental to your success or not. So the first thing is I want to reduce your expectations. So please give up thinking that it's easy. I think you know that. But also give up thinking that people will understand what you're doing or you will be rewarded and praised for what you're doing or your organization will be interested in what you're doing. This is not what happens to truly pioneering leaders. They are ignored, they are criticized, they are denigrated, they are personally attacked. And even when you produce fabulous results, nobody is interested in how you got them. I, have, I could quote endlessly about the number of pioneering leaders who had their bosses say to them, well, I love your results. I don't want to hear how you got them. I don't understand what you're doing, but it's working, so keep going. 
And those are the kinder, the kinder comments. So you have to just assume that this group of fellows, this group of cohort, will be your support system. But you won't get it from the organization at large. Just give that up. You'll be a lot happier if you don't look for praise or reward or recognition. But you can rely on the fact that this work is intrinsically self-motivating and rewarding. You will be surprised at people's capacities, who shows up. You'll be appreciated and respected by people and your staff. These are guarantees. And you will experience moments of deep satisfaction by watching another person bloom, by watching another person come up with a great solution by watching teamwork increase and trust grow and criticism diminish. This is wonderful, wonderfully rewarding. So that trust and confidence and strength, these are big words for me right now, we can become more confident that we are doing the right thing even though the world doesn't tell us that it's right. We get it from our staff, we get it from our a few colleagues, but it does grow. So we become more and more committed to this path. And here's just a simple way to start. We're not going to try and change the whole system because that's a setup for failure and exhaustion. But you can take the next new thing, the next new project, and use that and only that as a means to implement a new form of leadership. You start small. This is how we breed success. So the first thing is to focus on those principles of inclusion and participation and diversity. And as I said earlier, the way to ensure diversity is you just keep asking who else, who else, who else should be involved here? <coughs> especially when you come up against a hard bit or you come up against a wall. Who else should be involved in this? And then please restore thinking. So regular times to learn and especially when something goes wrong, gather together, stop the blame game and just look to understand in a richness and complexity why something failed. And then you as the leader, you have to reflect back frequently to staff. The staff will be very busy and very overwhelmed still. You have to keep, you have the broader view, you keep reflecting back to people. Well, this was good. This was good. Look at what we accomplished here because people will miss it. They've got their heads down. You have to keep your head up. And then this is an increasingly important role. You play defense to keep the larger system away. So people, you know, you're the mediator, the moderator of all these demands coming from the outside system. I don't know what you do about the request for more and more reports. But if you see your role as trying to play defense, then you can come up with good strategies for that. But it's a critical role for leaders right now. I actually am describing the kind of leadership that creates an island, an island of possibility, an island of sanity in the midst of this craziness from the larger system. And instead of seeking approval and recognition, you simply keep yourself below the radar. Become as invisible as possible. This is hard. This tests your own ego, but it really works. Because your focus is on creating what's a very different set of conditions for your staff, for the work they're accomplishing, this is not about getting praise 
for your own accomplishments as a leader. And finally, this is a motto that was given to me by a woman in a large healthcare uh, system in the States who said this was her new family motto, that they had gone way past uh, thinking that you, know, you should ask for forgiveness rather than permission. She said, our family motto is this, proceed until apprehended. So I am looking forward to um, further conversations that you'll have now amongst yourselves with three questions that I have provided that are designed to show you that you already know about this kind of hosting leadership in your own experience. And then we'll have time in the workshops. But I thought to leave you with a poem, so for those of you who are hesitating about the poetry workshop. You know, it's often the way, the only way we can e explore these deep emotions of this time is through the arts. This poem was written by, uh, in the 19, early, I think 1960, he wrote this. And uh, it describes so perfectly this time, 50, Three years later, he wrote, it's called For the Children, by the way. The rising hills, the slopes of statistics lie before us. The steep climb of everything going up, up as we all go down. In the next century, or the one beyond that, they say, our valleys and pastures, and we can meet there in peace if we make it. To climb these coming crests, one word to you, to you and your children. Stay together. Learn the flowers and go light. Stay together. Learn the flowers and go light. So we'll have more time together later. Thank you.